This segment is brought to you by 123 Digital Limited, your online and offline strategist. After the lockdown, when we were um, asked to come back out to work, I saw that all my suppliers and all the people that owed money came knocking at my door for money at the same time. Um, obviously, we were not getting the revenue that we are accustomed of getting. So we had to prioritize. Um, who was getting paid and when. And we also um, took, um, we also went out, reached out to the banks for assistance with, with regards to overdraft extensions. But it was very difficult in the beginning because this is the first time I've ever experienced anything like this. And like I said, everybody came asking for money at the same time. Um, Many difficult, but the schedule that we put in place to pay back our suppliers, knowing full well that we had to pay back everybody, we just had to um, prioritize it and put it on a schedule to ensure that we met our obligations to our suppliers. Um, with, with regards to sustainability, I think um, that question will be answered in a later question because we had to make some serious changes in our business to ensure that we continue to operate at a smaller level. Okay. Thank you. All right. Gretti, um, same question. You'd like me to repeat? No, that's okay. Um, for me, very early in the game, what we saw was um, our clients putting on hold or canceling our either current or pipeline projects. Obviously, the nature of our business is such that, you know, it's service oriented. Um, and the persons may not necessarily classify that as, as, um, as essential in a time like this. So obviously with our members, with our, sorry, with our clients all being um, business owners, they had to prioritize on their end and, and our service of, um, of course took a hit. So in making lots of decisions, we were impacted in that way. A lot of our projects were either canceled or put on hold and um, you know until further notice. So we're not sure yet when or if these projects will continue. That was the biggest hit for us. Um, of course, it allowed it 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 forced us to start to think about different ways of generating revenue. Um, and I think we'll touch on that a little later. But it it requires a change in mindset. It requires some changes in in um, in how we do business. And some of the things we had to do to respond, well, very early, we took the opportunity to, to lay off staff in an effort to um, reduce cost and to maintain, a, and I guess, allow the opportunity for us to keep the staff for a longer period. So um, initially, there was a, an offer for reduced pay, um, and some persons were laid off. Um, we've also moved to a fully um, remote working model. And again, the nature of our business allows us to do that. A lot of what we did, you know, we, we were working remotely already. So it's, it's, it's taking it a step further um, and basically moving to a full remote working model. So that's basically the, the, the biggest things for us right now. Okay, all right, thank you for that contribution. Um, with regard, you mentioned that you um, had to lay off some staff, right? Um, I know that was not a, uh, an, an easy, and it was a, definitely a difficult decision. Um, how receptive were your staff, you know, when they heard the news or when the news was um, given to them? Actually, they suggested it, which made it so much easier for me, you know, so um luckily for me i have a really good team um and you know even even if they're laid off they're still supporting still contributing still following up with clients and so on so yeah uh, the fact that the suggestion came from them made it easier okay that's great victor your question i'm a little bit different but i just wanted to know right has your association devised a plan to educate or advise small businesses on how to manage the cash flow in time of crisis? So from the Bankers Association perspective, um, 
obviously, initially, uh, as you said, Rankin, this um, you know was seen as 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 something that we needed to be able to to act on pretty quickly. Um, we knew that our uh, clients, both um, personal banking clients as well as corporate clients, small business clients, were going to be impacted in a significant way. So, so what we what we sought to do early was um, in conjunction with the um, ECCB um, and uh, and in conjunction with with the other members of the ECCU um, to come up with uh, a, a strategy to be able to provide our businesses with our clients with um, some cash flow relief in terms of any form of um, moratoria. So, so we all agreed um, very early on that it would be, um, you know, important for uh, for our customers to have access to um, uh, relief in that form. So, you know, all the banks agreed to either uh, a three month or a six month moratorium on principal and interest, um, and so. So from that perspective, we were we were very early on uh, providing them with uh, the necessary kind of relief that they needed. We also felt it was important to to have discourse with our with our clients. Um, so it, it wasn't so our support really wasn't just any form of uh, financial support, but also advisory. So we we felt it was important to reach out to our clients. Um, and to hold their hand, so to speak, through this process, because it is unprecedented. Um, none of us here have ever experienced anything like this before, and we're hoping that we never have to do again. Um, so it was important that we reached out to our clients, stay close to our, to our customers, um, to help guide them through this process in terms of, of helping them to, um, as, you, as, as the question um, suggested, you know, manage your cash flow. Uh, what 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 things can they do to to reduce their their expenses at this time? Um, so provide that advisory type of a of a role. So so all the banks would have would have engaged with their clients um, either directly or through various social media, um, etc., to ensure that we were playing our part in this uh, very important um, time. All right, thanks. Um, can you explain to us um, exactly how the monitorium works? And, um, and uh, just uh, explain a little bit more why um, there is, why individuals need to pay the interest at this time. Right, so, so the monitorium basically, um, from, from a definition perspective, monitorium is um, a, a deferral of uh, one's principal and or interest obligation. Um, and, and I use the word deferral because that's essentially what it is. Um, it is. It is not a waiver of your obligations. Um, it was important, uh, like I said, that the banks provided um, a cash flow cushion at this time. And one of the largest obligations that any business would have uh, is outside of salaries, et cetera, would be your principal and interest payments. So what we sought to do was to um, meet with our clients and to provide uh, the deferral of or moratoria for principal and or interest. And I say and or, um, specifically because a client has the ability to choose whether or not they wanted both um, a principal and an interest um, moratoria, or they could have chosen uh, they could have chosen to just have a uh, a principal moratoria and pay the interest. Um, the banks cannot waive their interests. Um, let me just say that uh, up front. Interest is one of the key ways that banks generate income. And so in order for us to, to ensure the viability of our operations, just like any other business, we have to ensure that, that, um, that our 
revenues are 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 still you know being paid um and and so we couldn't uh, we can't uh waive interest um for for our client but what we sought to do was understanding that um that it was important that they get relief cash flow relief um during this period where their revenues are also impacted that we will provide them with with the principal and or interest um, moratorium um and and so if if you if you kind of one of the members of the bankers association put it this way uh to waive interest is is akin to um us walking into a supermarket for example and picking up your groceries and not paying for them um you know in a in a in a simple way that's that's pretty much what what uh, a waiver of interest uh, amounts to um and we have obligations to our depositors um and so if it is that we were to to um to waive our interest we still have interest expense to pay on those deposits um so it would put undue strain on on the banks in order to do so 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 um so we provided the the principal and interest um uh relief or deferral so that our clients themselves could uh, be able to fight um, stronger uh, through this period, um, because uh, as I said, principal interest obligations are some of the largest that that any client would face um, outside of salary obligations, et cetera. All right, thank you very much for that contribution. Um, Adele. <laughs> Good morning again. Good morning. Uh, with regards to the insurance industry, customer payments are essential for the survival of your company as it relates to policy collections, payouts, etc. What have you done to keep your head above water? Uh, I think it's, it's more what we've done to, to stay sustainable, like Dima would have mentioned. Um, our focus has been sustainability during the pandemic. Uh, like other companies, the business continuity uh, was impacted by the country shutdown and upon reopening we would have had to adjust our mode of operations to comply with the state of emergency but even before that we did prepare ourselves to um, to accommodate our team and our customers and we encouraged them to to utilize e-commerce uh, in order to accept payments uh, online um, transactions, whether it be logging claims or posting inquiries, um, you can request. And we would use our website for that, email addresses, hotlines, etc., so that we could we could work with them during this time. And of course, we we too had to make adjustments with our um, IT team to be able to facilitate direct deposits deposit sorry to their accounts um, to make claim payouts because. While we are a service industry and it's not, um, a, let's say, it's, it's an intangible um, product that we provide, we still need to provide that peace of mind and we still have obligations to meet to our policyholders. So our reps would have continued to keep in constant communication with customers, with our agents, affiliates, etc., to find out how this has impacted them and how we could assist, whether it be restructuring their credit policies, uh, the policy coverage, suspending certain policies um, as needs be to provide a refund, which could aid with the cash flow, uh, you know, and this was done consistently, like I said, by our team. And we would have dealt with it on a case to case basis because circumstances do vary. And we continue to do that in order to remain sustainable. Again, is the focus is sustainability. And to be honest, before, uh, well, at the start of the year, we actually did make an adjustment to our plans for this year, which made it, um, made these decisions more flexible for us because we, our focus was to revisit our, our policies and procedures and not expend too much on marketing this year, et cetera. So cash flow for us was already going to be better managed from the start of this year. And we just aim to do the same with our team and our customers. Okay, great. Um, it's good to hear that you guys have been able to do 
something digitally, you know, with the payments. I'm happy to hear that. And even um, the first thing was how do we continue to pay our claims? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so it's very good to hear that. Um, thanks for that contribution. I'm Warren. Hi. You there? The same question would apply to you as an insurance broker. You could, you could um, give us an answer on, on insurance broker perspective, right? But I'll just read it again. Um, with regards to the insurance industry, customer payments are essential for the survival of your company as it relates to policy collections, PS, et cetera. What have you done to keep your head above water? Hi, <laughs> Rankin. Um, for us, what we've been able to do is essentially, well, in fact, what we had to do was to essentially restructure how we make collections. Um, since we were unable to have persons come in physically to make payments or even go to their um, workplaces and so forth, we had to now become more um, online um, present, if, 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 if I may say. Um, so what we had to do essentially was just to provide persons with an ability to make payments via our, our banks. Um, and we continued being as aggressive as we've been in, in the past in terms of um, calling persons and asking them to, to make payments. Um, for us, really, the... COVID-19 wasn't really a challenge in the sense that um, it, it threw everything out of whack. Um, COVID-19 is a, is a disaster, just like any other disasters. In insurance, we, we, we sort of, um, what's the word on this? Um, we, we, <laughs> We take on, we see disaster, we see risk as an opportunity, as an challenge. So for me, for, for me, for my company, it was an exciting time because we were experiencing something that we generally hadn't experienced. But it was not unlike a hurricane or it wasn't unlike a fire that somebody had had. It was just a different type of disaster. Um, the only challenge, like I said, from, from the beginning was our method in terms of collections. Um, we were still able to, to call our customers. We just had to be a bit more um, improvised in the way we collected. So it had to take a lot of more telephone calls. Um, and again, a lot of emails were going out. Persons had to tweak their approaches when it comes to, to paying us. Um, I deal with a lot of walk-in customers or what we call personal customers. So persons would be coming into the office making payments. Um, we also cater for a lot of the older folk or the older generation who are not as tech savvy as the younger generation. So it was a bit of an adjustment for them to make payments. Um, and so we had to rely a lot on, you know, the, the, the banking industry and persons either making a wire transfer or going into the bank to make a deposit. So the challenge really wasn't the, the COVID-19. Um, but it was really in the form of collections. You have to understand to the industry that we're in, insurance is not something that persons really like to, to pay. Um, <clears throat> it's always... <laughs> it's always... It's, it's not a priority, Warren. <laughs> well, um, it's not a priority. It's not something that they like to pay. Insurance is something that people would reserve for last. After they've done everything else, then they decide, Okay, how much I'm going to, to, to pay. So we're already in a mode where we have to do whatever we have to, to collect our premiums, to collect payment. Um, so again, whether it is the telephone calls um, or, or going after the customer where we couldn't go because um, that, that was out of the question. So it just had to be a, a re education and getting persons to, to do the online transactions, going into the banks and so forth. Okay, great. All right, so um, that's for this question is for Warren and also Adele. Um, we know that a lot of people may not have that disposable income anymore, you know, to make the, the payments, right? At this time, you know, they may be, they want to, but unfortunately, they, won't, they are unable to make those payments. Have you guys uh, made any special arrangements with customers like um, like the banks, like a monitorium, monitorium, or anything like that? 
Um, uh, well, I was going to go. Okay. Okay. I'll, so, I'll, okay. Um, we've, we've had discussions as an industry with the banking sector, um, specifically geared at trying to help customers meet their um, insurance premiums. Um, I need to say, though, that unlike a bank, we're not able to just give a moratorium because, as Adele will tell you shortly, we have obligations um, and we have costs that we've already incurred that we must meet. And the nature of insurance is that it is sort of like a yearly contract. Um, so if we don't collect premiums within the currency of the policy, it becomes so much more difficult to encourage somebody to pay for um, premiums of a previous year. Um, so what we've done is, um, well, thankfully I'm a, I'm a broker, so I don't have as many headaches as Adele would have. Um, but what we've done is we've tried to have payment plans um, that insurers have agreed upon um, and manage it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we look at the, the, the person, the scenario, um, what obtains, and then we make an informed decision of how we're going to facilitate the person's request. In some instances, what we've also done is we've also tweaked the, um, the, the policy or the, the insurance package. So somebody, for instance, may, uh, may have had a million dollar um, property insurance um, or business insurance policy. But given the new, um, the new dynamic, a lot of the coverage may not be necessary. So we've had to reduce cover in some sense. So instead of somebody having to pay premiums on a million dollars, they probably now pay on $500,000. Um, so what we've had to do as a brokerage firm is to try to look at different scenarios to allow the customer to one, um, to, well, to, to keep the coverage that they have, but also to look to see whether the, the coverage they have is what they really need right now to see what tweaks that we can make. Um, and finally, I started off by saying we've been speaking to some of the banks. Now, the banking industry have decided in, on some occasions that what they can do is to pay the um, insurance on behalf of those customers who've been affected. But again, that's on a case-by-case -case basis. Adele? Uh, yes, uh, well, you pretty much took everything out <laughs> of my mouth. But um, I, to add to that, so we do understand that individuals have competing obligations. You know, do I pay my internet bill? Do I pay my water bill? Do I pay? Well, insurance is way down there. And as mentioned earlier, we try to work with them, taking all into consideration. It has to be a discussion. Uh, we have to inform them, like or instead of um, the type of coverage that you have, um, what your circumstances are, and reduce accordingly, which would ultimately um, reduce your premium as well. Um, insurance is, is a product where the premium you pay does not equate in any way to the types of payouts that we have to make. Uh, so we we try to provide solutions where possible and in the insurance industry it's not a one-size-fits-all uh, for instance the while consumers may have the the option of deferring mortgage payments like as mentioned earlier we cannot defer your coverage in the same vein and as a responsible corporate entity we have to remain financially stable and that has been our contribution during to remain and stay focused, um, meeting our obligations to our policyholders. All right, thank you. All right, just so- to, Just to add on that point as well, we do have the impending hurricane season, which we have to um, ensure we, we can continue making claims and provide that peace of mind to our consumers that we, we can do that with ease, even during this economic downturn. Uh, with this impending hurricane season, which is, projected to be very active. Um, you can only imagine how scary a time it is on top of this already major crisis. Yes. All right, Adele, thank you for the contribution. All right, we have a few questions um, from our attendees. I shall read one right now. Any of you could, um, could answer, 
right? That was, I think that was more or less um, regarding Garetti's um, response earlier. In relation to pay reductions, has this also seen a reduction in working hours or have your staff been required to work at the same rate pre-COVID? What has been the reception of, the, of these payment reductions, especially regarding productivity, employment engagement, and morale? So, Gerati, you'd like to answer that? Um, well, I, I have a peculiar circumstance because my team, my team is exceptional. So as it relates to that, remember, these suggestions came from them. So, you know, in terms of how they perceived it and, and how they performed during the period, that, that has been very favorable. Um, obviously, I did indicate that our <laughs> workload had been reduced with, with our clients putting on hold or canceling some of our projects. So um, they were not required to work at the same pace or to, to carry the same workload because obviously a lot of what we had to do um, <clears throat> was not applicable anymore. Um, so yes, with the reduction in pay, did come a reduction in, in the workload and the expectation of how much effort they had to put in to get it done. Okay, great. Damon, you like to contribute? Or did you have to reduce any hours and also um, um, salaries? Yes, actually I did. Um, for the most part, uh, I had some workers doing a three-day work week mm -hmm. and uh, the salaries. My staff, um, basically, in a small company, so my staff sees everything that goes on. And uh, you could see the reduction in the sales from the time, <clears throat> end of March, April. And my staff, I, I staff as transparent as my staff from the beginning with regards to uh, the volume of sales, with regards to what, ch what changes were impending and what came up. And uh, for a lot of them, they maintain their regular salaries. But a few of them had to um, take pay cuts. Some, had, some of them had to change their job functionality. And, um, and I told them, the new, the new way of doing business is you do more with less. And that's just the bottom line. I mean, we, I, I tried my best to keep everybody employed. And I think the staff are very resilient. And they understand that we have to make sacrifices in this time, in this current time. So yes, we did make changes. The staff were very receptive. Um, and they understand this is as normal. All right, great. Um, I would probably just add my two cents to that. Um, even with us at Daz Magazine 123 Digital, we did have to um, reduce the working hours and therefore um, the, the, our team members would have a, a reducing in, in, in salary pay cuts. You know, um, I must say that a lot of people are very re resilient at this time. Um, because they are very understanding and, um, and they understand in order for the business to survive, um, the business itself needs to be proactive and various measures need to be put in place for the survival, sustainability, continuity. You know, so I have to commend um, our team, you know, and, 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 and people in general, you know, for understanding at this time, right? I have another question, general question to the panel. What is the plan for recovery post COVID-19 on the micro and the macro level within your respective industries and in the general economy respectively? Anyone would like to answer that? I think we I think we're all trying to figure out what post COVID even looks like. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. In the short term, we can we can speak to um, remaining resilient, um, having faith, and it's the best time or the opportune time to to reinvent yourselves, your brand, your business, how you do business. Um, but there's there's no standard practice right now because there's no precedent as to how we remain viable. It really depends on how creative you are, and I think um, as a standard business practice, of course, you do make provisions for any possible shortfalls in your projections, and I think that's what most of us would would be doing right now, making post-COVID projections in order to sustain, be sustainable during this short term. Um, Okay, and I'm gonna. I I just wanted to add there as well, Rankin. Sorry. Um, I think I think what 
what this has done is really, really accelerated, um, you know, how we do banking in terms of, of us moving more rapidly toward digital transformation. Um, you know, we, we really saw the need um, for our clients to have access to um, all of the bank's resources, all of their, uh, you know, their accounts, being able to move money, transfer money, pay uh, vendors, pay salaries, all of those things. And in scenarios where, uh, for us here, where we were closed, um, you know, our clients obviously felt it was important to be able to continue to do business for those businesses that were still open, um, but digitally. And so we've had a number of our clients um, who in some instances were, were a bit hesitant initially to go the digital route. Um, but but when, when COVID happened, um, they, they saw how important it was for them to be able to, to, to access uh, their resources to continue to do business, but digitally. Um, and so this, in my view, will, will, will change the nature of how we do banking and make uh, and, and cause persons to think more of how can I reduce actually physically coming into the bank um, to conduct that transaction? Um, why am I still paying my staff via check? Can't I, um, you know, uh, shouldn't I have access to, to be able to pay my staff while I'm at home at, at, at 10 o'clock in the night, you know? Um, and, and so it has really, really changed just the, just the, just the face of, of banking in general. And a lot of our, all of our clients um, have uh, opted to go the, the digital route, thankfully, to be able to, to continue to, to, to do their business, so. All right, thanks. And one last question on this segment, right? Um, and that goes to, again, insurance. What advice will you give a policyholder who has lost their job because of the COVID pandemic about crashing in, about cashing, sorry, in their policy to make ends meet? So what advice will you give a policyholder who has lost their job because of the COVID pandemic about cashing in their policy to make ends meet? Warren, you want to answer that? Yeah, sure, Ranking. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, we <laughs> the policies that we issue um, for PNC or what we call property and casualty, you can't really cash them unless there is an event that gives rise to a loss. And those losses have to be triggered by something physically happening. Um, the only policies that I'm aware of that you can cash in are um, policies linked with um, or employee benefits or life and health and so forth that have um, an endowment plan or a savings plan to it. So if persons are aware or can remember, you know, in some of your life policies, you have the basic amount which you pay for your life insurance, and then there is an additional bit that you pay in savings. Um, and that saving component, you can tap into it in times like these. And so there is a possibility to cash out. Um, for property, um, the only way you can cash out really is to cancel the policy. And, and um, hope, hopefully you get some returns um, from the cancellation. But you, 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 you can't really see... Um, <laughs> Adele might want to, to chime in, but um, from the top of my head, I can't think of any other way that a policy would sort of give you some sort of cash reward um, unless it is a, a life policy with a savings component to it. Yeah, you're correct, Warren. Um, it depends on the type of policy that was issued. And in, for instance, your motor, your home, you, you, can't, you can't cash in on that. Um, Okay, guys. Uh, but, oh, sorry. Continue. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. Are you sure? Yeah, go ahead. Go right. ahead. Okay. Well, guys, thank you for your contribution. We shall move on to the next question. All right. So, business can suffer and can be 
at risk of closure without the intervention of financial institution, whether it be facilitating and authorizing overdrafts or increasing limits or deferring loan payments to name a few. Victor, I know we touched on it a little bit in the previous um, question, but how have the member banks been able to cushion the financial burden of its business customers? Right. So, so from a from a business perspective, um, what we've done, as I mentioned before, are are a few things. One, um, recognizing that in this time, uh, management of cash flow is uh, a delicate art in the normal course of business, um, and and so in this environment, COVID nineteen. Uh, management of cash flow is even more challenging now because um, revenues of, of, of decline in some instances completely um, disappeared. Um, you are, you know, if you're open and you're continuing to do business, you may find that, um, you know, it takes you a bit longer to, to, to get payment for a service that you've offered. Um, it is challenging collecting on your receivables. You still have, in some instances, um, operating expenses to meet. So all of these items contribute to, to um, challenges towards uh, the management of, of cash flow. Um, and so, and so what, what the banks have, have done is to uh, work in conjunction with each client on a case-by-case -case basis to understand what is their cash flow gap? So, in other words, um, how what are your what are your obligations, and um, and and what are your commitments, and how can we provide uh, increasing your overdraft or grant you an overdraft in the instances where people never had one, but were operating on a purely cash basis, um, to be able to bridge that financing gap, um, and so that's what in a lot of instances that's what we would have done. Um, we, we would have also, so, so that's one, um, you know, providing increases in overdrafts. Um, I mentioned already the, the whole, uh, uh principal and interest moratorium. Um, so where, you know, you would normally have, uh, let's say a thousand dollars to pay in principal and interest. Um, and uh, we would have provided you with uh, a moratorium for that principal and interest for up to six months. That thousand dollars that you would have paid in principal and interest, you no longer have to pay um, during that specific six month period. And so, and so that is cash flow that you can um, otherwise deploy within your business um, to, to ensure um, uh, viability. Um, and then thirdly, um, so in, in the instance of, as I said before, um, advice, we, you know, people, we don't, we're not just in a business of, of providing, um, financial solutions or providing overdrafts and, um, and term loans and, and corporate credit cards and those things. Uh, we are in a business of, of helping our customers and holding our customers' hands, um, and giving them, um, financial advice helping them manage through the process, um, helping them uh, with, with uh, understanding how, they're, they're, uh, you know, how they should be planning for situations like this um, in terms of forecasting, um, maybe for, for the next three to six months after COVID, helping them kind of reset their expectations those kinds of things. So, so we are um, very much front and center in terms of um, providing financial advice, as I said, um, uh, financial solutions, but also uh, advice um, to them uh, across the board. All right, Victor. Um, with regards to the process to get an overdraft or even financial assistance, right? Is it is it an easier process now, or have you guys made provisions to make the process a lot faster to be approved? So, so what, what um, a lot of banks have done is we've, 
you know, we've recognized um, that, for example, in, in this period, um, it is most of our customers would have been impacted by COVID. Um, so some banks, what, what, what some banks would have done is an opt-in, opt-out type of a, of a situation when it came to the moratoria. Um, uh, other banks would have said, uh, you know, we are providing you with the, with the moratoria. You just, you know, you call in and say, well, yes, I do uh, require um, that, that uh, moratoria. And in a lot of instances, there isn't any um, application, long application process that has to be gone into. We recognize that these are, these are challenging times. And, uh, and we felt it was important to be able to move pretty quickly, to be able to grant um, the, the, the moratoria, as well as to grant um, the, the overdraft increase. Um, so we've made it um, as easy as possible under the circumstances for clients to be able to access those, those particular facilities. All right, thank you very much. Um, Damon? How has your financial institution assisted you during this pandemic? Well, from the beginning, Rangin, um, I think early March, I started working with my bank because I was following trends on the international market and looking to see what would eventually happen to St. Lucia with regards to them locking down the country. So every, um, prior to the lockdown, everything was going as normal and then we had a lockdown and then we, we, uh, for seven days and then we came back and then we decided not to open the business um because i mean the fear was in, in, was already in me and and in my staff as well and then we decided to take one week before we opened when we opened um i reached out to my financial institution for the first week we monitored sales for the first week and we saw uh the decline right and then in the second week it was even worse. And, uh, but then I also had obligations to pay my suppliers, my foreign suppliers. So I reached out to my mom I, and I, I sent all the information to them. I was very transparent with them from the beginning, which helped a lot. We have a very close relationship, by the way. So it's the first national bank. And um, it was transparent. I asked them for an increase <laughs> in the overdraft. Um, I asked for the moratorium. The, honored the overdraft, um, even though they did not give me what I was looking for, but they gave me enough <laughs> what, what I could cover, you know, and um, with the moratorium, I, they, they said they would put it in place. And what happened was that at the end of the month, my loan payment came out. <laughs> so I called the bank immediately and I said, hey, what's going on? I asked for moratorium. You'll agree to it. Why is the money coming out? They said, no, Damon, those charges will be reversed. They said, you know, you already have to keep it, right? But let's see what happens next month. Let's see what happens at the end of the month. But the bank, First National, have been very, very supportive. I must give them a, a, a hand of applause for, for being supportive. Um, what made it easier for me is that I already had an overdraft facility in place. Um, so they, and I adjusted my financials for the bank. So they could have just used that information Plus, they, they see what I deposit every day. Even though they saw the decline, they know the type of business I'm in. It's an essential business. So they, they, were, they, were, they were quick to respond for me. I am not sure how, <clears throat> how they responded to other people who did not have over, overdraft facilities. I know um, one of the banks, I was talking to another business friend, and he said the banks asked for the full, um, full list of requirements as in terms of financial statements, business plan, and I was kind of surprised because that customer had been working at the banks for a while, with, with that bank for a while. And he asked, but why? You know, um, this is uh, not business as usual. It's a, it's a crisis. And I'm asking for your assistance to help me um, meet my obligations. And you're asking me for all my financials. Basically, I'm asking them for all the um, necessary information um, that would help them make a decision. So. I did not have that problem, but like I said, I can only speak from my standpoint because I had an overdraft um, in place already. I'm not sure how it impacted other people. But First National, I would say, and I'm not advertising for First National. I'm just saying that they have been very, very supportive yes. and uh, they're working with me. And we still talk every day in terms of 
um, I mean, if I, if, I, if I run into any problems, I mean, I've made changes in my business to maintain my revenue with my expenses and, my, and what I import. So right now, we're just watching and we pay it by F and R, but they've been very supportive. All right, thank you. Thank you, Damon. Um, Gretti, same question. Would you like me to repeat? Yes, please. How has your financial institution assisted you during this pandemic? Well, similar to Damon, um, we took advantage of the moratorium. Um, again, the nature of our business is service-oriented, so we, we don't have that many suppliers that we have to deal with. Um, so the, more, the, the things that really assisted us um, with the moratorium and obviously the waiver of um, fees on the credit cards because a lot of what we our suppliers would be um, paid by a credit card so um, waiving those fees during that time made it easier um, you know not having to incur all these additional um, expenses okay thank you very much adele as a top level management of an insurance company does your company assist its clients financially in any way? And if so, how? I, I think I spoke on that earlier, um, that it's an intangible product and how we um, assist, I should say, is by continuing to have that ongoing conversation with our customers. We cannot um, waive premiums because we need those premiums to continue paying the claims. We definitely understand the, the, the need to drive some other alternatives and um, solutions and we can, we can only continue to, to present you with those, um, those options um, in order for us to remain financially stable. We continue to pay our reinsurers and that's one of our biggest, our biggest costs as an insurance company that we too have that financial backing um, to support during these, these times, especially with the, again, upcoming hurricane season. So I, I'm being a bit repetitive because with insurance, it's, it's, it's a unique combination of expenses that we have and we don't close our doors and that's it um, during a shutdown. We continue to have um, submissions of medical claims, um, acc um, accidents that happen, uh, whether it be a bus pipe at a house, whether it be, um, you know, um, uh, burglary, we still continue to have to meet those obligations to our policyholders. And we want to ensure that we remain sound for them. Um, so that is how we financially assist. <laughs> right. um, Warren, you'd like to shed some light on that? Um, well, similar to Adele, we, there's not much financial assistance that we can give. Um, the only thing that we can attempt to do is to just have conversations with customers to see exactly um, how we can probably eliminate some coverage that they don't want. That in turn will redound to a saving to them. But in terms of us being able like a lending institution to extend some sort of monetary um, advance. Um, unfortunately, our business is such that we, we can't do those things. Um, I, if I have to go back to a previous comment, um, probably the, the only um, way that that can happen is if you were able to make an, uh, uh, sorry, a drawdown on a, a savings that you have on your life policy, but outside of that, our hands are essentially tight. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I have a few questions here, right? Um, question for Warren. It's a little bit, I have a little math in it, right? If you reduce the coverage from 1 million to 500K, what happens if there is a claim? Do you inform the bank if the customer has a loan? Is this really advisable and will the law of average of averages apply? Um, <clears throat> I saw that question um, posted. When I spoke earlier about reducing the sums insured, um, I was speaking more f in terms of probably a liability policy or a business interruption policy. 
um, not specifically for property because property has a, a fixed rebuild um, value um, that, of course, if you tweak with um, average will apply. And I don't want to get into all of the details of what average is. But of course, if, if somebody reduces the value of the house, if there is a claim, unfortunately, the claim will be paid in proportion to the reduction in the, in the um, under insurance. Um, so when I was speaking earlier, it was more for items like business interruption. And a business interruption policy is based on revenue projections of gross profit and so forth, um, on wages and things of that sort. Now, if you, during COVID-19, are obviously out of business or you're closed or you have laid off staff, then those revenue projections would um, invariably decrease. Um, your wages would decrease. So the amounts that you would start it off as insuring, um, and if you're using, let's say, $100,000 a month in revenue projection, um, with COVID-19, you're, you're, um, you're closed for five, six months. So that amount goes down to $600,000. Um, it doesn't make financial sense to continue having coverage of a million dollars when you can only feasibly recoup um, if you had a loss subsequent to COVID. Um, you could possibly only recoup um, $600,000 or, or what you've actually generated. Um, insurance does not um, pay you a profit. They only give you back <laughs> what, you've, what, you've, um, what you're insured for. Um, so that was really what I was talking about and not necessary to, to reduce the um, value of a, of a property. So I hope that clears things up a bit. Okay. All right. I have another question. Right. COVID-19 has pushed businesses into the gig economy. For the most, it was a forced transition. Do you have any plan in place going forward to embrace remote technology and security? Will a remote policy be part of your business plan? Will there be a budget in place for technology and security in the new business atmosphere? Mr. Walters, do you plan to move to a mobile platform for ordering and delivery? So, Damon, that was for you. And anybody else who could answer after Damon? Um, for me, um, we've uh, always um, uh, dabbled with the technology um, with regards to putting my company online. COVID-19 forced me to forced me to come up with applications whereby. We could reach our customers and 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 um, get to them in a safe way. Um, I do plan on increasing um, my online presence, whether it's through social media or creating an application where people could order and then deliver. But it has always been part of um, the company's strategic thinking going forward in terms of having. Um, technology play a critical role in our business. So yes, I am moving forward with technology um, in mind. Okay, cool. And also we have to remember um, not just ordering, but also making payments, you know, another form of uh, a revenue stream, another um, income generator right there. And uh, we also have to focus on security because um, we've been talking about online moving digitally, but I don't think we focused on the security aspects because we don't want um our private and confidential information to be hacked you know and be used for for malice um adele i'll i'll pose that question to you as well because you did mention earlier that um you guys um more or less have tried to use the online platforms to receive payments etc right and there's still a lot more that we can do um of course with the advanced technology but it has made or it did make it so much easier for our customers who had various queries as to how can i continue to pay my medical insurance how can i keep my home covered can i make a deposit um to to just again manage their cash flow um and 
during the shutdown, of course, we were unable to, to, to meet persons or even for them to go to their broker or their agent. And mm -hmm. that really assisted during those times. And we will continue to, to improve on our facilities for that purpose. Even right now, we're taking a complete re look at revamping our systems for post-COVID, I should say. Okay, and, um, and another question to you, um, and that is just based on what you said as well. Um, someone did, did ask, is there a facility in place by your organization to pay premiums directly if they are out of state? Right? Um, this has been a long standing issue for me, that individual. Um, finally, they noticed that some organizations are making the move to Shopee. So if you are to, but basically, I think the meat of this question is um, how. So we have facilitated wire. state, yeah. Okay, we facilitate wire um, transfers, online transfers. We have for years now. So okay. we continue to do that. All right, no problem. That's it. Okay, so we shall move on. For all the attendees who are asking questions, um, if I haven't addressed your question as yet, um, we do have time towards the end of the um, session where we're going to have a Q&A and I'll go through as many questions as possible before our, our deadline. All right, so next question. Insurance can be defined as a practice or arrangement by which a company or government provides a guarantee of compensation for financial loss, damage, illness, or death in return for payment of a premium. Many businesses have taken out such policies as, sorry, many businesses have taken out such a policy as sold to protect with business from financial loss if such a situation arises. So, Goretti, I'm gonna to go to you first, right? Do you have an insurance cover that protects you from loss of income during crisis? I wish, Rankin. Right. I wish. <laughs> no, I don't. I have, in, I mean, as an entrepreneur, I have insurance that covers um, for loss of income due to illness. Right. But definitely we did not foresee a situation like this occurring. And I'm not even sure, I'm, I'm eager to hear what the representatives from the insurance sector would say to that. I'm not sure that they offer that kind uh, of thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Some... I think I'll jump in here just you to say jump? that. <laughs> All right. No, un unfortunately, global pandemic is uh, horrible as it, of course, impacts all lines of insurance and all at once. And only a government entity actually would be able to financially or to have the financial resources to cover pandemic risks. Um, how would we even adequately price something of that nature? You know, um, there's no data to support payouts of, on such types of risks, but it is a time to be innovative. So let's see what our industry can possibly come up with. Yeah, so... Um if you allow me to jump in ranking, sorry. No problem. Um, so, just to... And even before you jump in, I could just address it to the two of you immediately, right? Um, I know right. earlier you said it's very difficult for insurance companies to provide financial assistance like that. Um, with me, I just wanted to know, is there any plan moving forward? You know, is there any policy learning from our pandemic right now? Is this something in the pipeline that we will see in the future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you can, that's, that's my question. Right, so... Um, yeah. Oh, Warren, you can go, go ahead. Go ahead, Warren. Yeah. No, Adele will go and I'll jump in afterwards. Okay. <laughs> Adele, go first. No, I was just going to reiterate um, the point that globally there, there doesn't seem to be any data to support that. So it would definitely have to be something that... Um, we, we globally, as an insurance industry, we would have to see if it's feasible and how do you adequately price it. Right. It may cost you an amount of leg if, if so little. <laughs> right. All right, one. Right. So, um, <clears throat> one of the great things about the insurance industry is we're very resilient and we're like a, a phoenix that, that rises from the ashes. So, no matter what catastrophe faces us, we're always able to come out of it stronger. 
Um, and one of the things that I've, I've well, ever since COVID-19, um, I've done a lot of reading and investigations, and there are actually policies um, that cater to such um, occurrences. So one of them is what we call a, a, a non-physical damage business interruption policy. So presently, a lot of, well, most people are familiar with a business interruption policy, which is triggered by physical occurrences. So something must be damaged. You must have a hurricane, a name storm, a burst pipe, a fire, et cetera, et cetera, for your, your business interruption policy to make some sort of payment. Um, and that payment would invariably give you some sort of relief um, so you can continue meeting your expenses and for your, your business to continue to be a going concern. Um, but with COVID-19 being an illness, something that, that hasn't really touched us physically, um, it was sort of difficult for that policy or those policies to respond. But um, in my readings, I know, for example, Swiss Re, one of the largest reinsurers in the world, offers this product. Um, again, it's called a non-physical damage business interruption policy. And it caters for such things like cyber, cyberware or cyber attacks, um, um, infectious diseases, and so forth. But going back to something Adele just said, while it's available, it may cost you significantly um, to, to, to get that type of cover. And given what we know now and how much devastation um, a COVID-19 can cause. Um, and, and you know insurance companies <laughs> um, will not do anything that they know they can lose from. Um, I'm sure the pricing might be a bit um, um, prohibitive, but there are things that can be put in place you know, for any future occurrences um, of this type. Okay. Damon, right. yeah, Frank. your question, right, is similar to Garetti, but hold, hold on. Mm -hmm. hello, Look. you get me now, right? Yeah. So your question is similar, right? Which is, do you have an insurance cover that protects you from loss of income during crisis? But in your case, loss as a result of spoilage of stock due to pandemic. Okay, so this question, um, I, have, I have an insurance policy that covers loss of income um, during crisis, but it's not, it's for, um, like um, Warren just said, it's a business interruption policy for physical, like a hurricane, force majeure, basically, mm -hmm. right? So at the beginning, I reached out to my insurance company and I said, listen, this thing is like, it is force majeure. It's a disaster. It's not a hurricane. It's not. It's not um, a storm. It's not a flood. But it is along the same lines where you have business interruption, and it's a disaster and it's a crisis. So, what part of my insurance policy covers that part? Um, <laughs> said the man, you know, let me let me go to research and I'll get back to you. He did get back to me and. Ranking, I swear to God, mm -hmm. you can ask Adele and Warren, there is no policy that covers pandemics. Right. Not even the reinsurance will cover a pandemic. Right? Fortunately, um, my freezers kept running whilst we were closed. And the products that I carry could last up to two years in, once they're kept in the right conditions. So I don't have products that expire very quickly. Um, perishable um, products. So I was lucky on that front. But um, I was pretty surprised that I learned a lot because I, was, I learned that pandemics are not covered by any insurance company and it sounded like it was worldwide. And Adele or Warren, you could correct me on that, but my insurance um, company said not even the insurance, the reinsurance, reinsurance would cover a pandemic. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thanks for that. Victor, do the banks recommend or advise any form of corporate insurance to business that will safeguard them against pandemics or loss of revenue? Also, 
are there plans to include this type of insurance of, as an option and recommend it to new and existing customers? Now, I know throughout this conversation and this dialogue, right, our insurance partners right here um, have given us the answer, um, but we, <laughs> we want to hear your view on this. So insur insurance is a critical component of, of, of how we do business. Um, whether it is property insurance, um, you know, insurance over um, contents, but also business interruption insurance. For our, for our corporates in particular, um, we, we do recommend, uh, require, um, let's say for, for a hotels, for our hotel uh, clients, that they do have um, business interruption insurance in place. Um, and, and that's primarily because not just not just for our hospitality clients, but but for our for our clients that that are that are running any kind of business that could be impacted by an event, um, like a hurricane, for example, that can impact on your revenues. Business interruption insurance is critical. Now, the whole the whole question about about pandemic being included in that business interruption type of a policy is a different is a different question altogether. Um, and, and, and I'm sure that coming out of this, there will be uh, a lot of discussion around can such um, uh, an occurrence be added into a policy to cover business interruption insurance. Um, I think it was Damon that, that, that mentioned, um, you know, th this, is, this is akin to force majeure. So, you know, it, it basically, how do you kind of um, how do you kind of ensure against a situation like this? Um, it is it is it is a challenge, um, but as I said, I'm sure that as long as the insurance companies are able to include it in 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 their policies, that at some point um, we will be looking very very closely at at uh, the inclusion of of pandemic in in the in the actual uh, coverage for for um, for a loss due to pandemic, it, this is this is unprecedented. Nobody's ever come across it, so um, I I can't say that it will that we will require it, but I'm sure that you know we will be foolhardy not to consider um, pandemics in, um, in in insurance policies going forward. I think even to um, touch on. Um, history a bit. This we foresee this coming in waves. So even if, as an insurance industry, we were to try to accommodate um, this type of product, you can almost foresee it happening again. And how soon we don't know. How do we quantify the amount of coverage we advise our customers to to take? We, you know, it will definitely have to be um, dialogue. Um, held on that. There will definitely have to be dialogue held on that. For sure. Okay, great. All right, so we have some questions from, the, um, from our attendees. So um, I'll go straight to a question we posted earlier. Taking into consideration the current crisis, what packages to, what packages do banks have in place for companies who still have to invest and take advantage of new opportunities that have presented themselves during the pandemic, especially the IT companies. So Victor, I think that's for you. Yeah, so the banks, I just want to say we're, we're, we're still open for business, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we haven't, we haven't um, closed off our doors uh, from the perspective of lending opportunities. Um, we were only physically closed for, for, for about a week or two during this whole pandemic. Um, and we were open the entire time um, after, before and after those, that two-week closure. So we are, we are, we're physically open and we're open for business from the perspective of, of, of lending. Now, um, obviously during this period, we, we have to be very prudent in terms of, of how we lend. Um, you know, COVID has, has put um, a, a, a lot more, um, uh, let me say, uh, 
requirements in terms of, of who we lend to and under what circumstances we lend to during this pandemic. So for example, um, we have, we have um, decided at First Caribbean that um, you know, we, we are a very large player in the hospitality industry. Um, and so while this um, pandemic is going on and many of our hotels are closed, um, we are still very much working with our hospitality clients to be able to do, um, you know, in some instances, they may have delayed some capex, capital expenditure that they wanted to do over the previous years. This may be the opportunity while you're closed to be able to, um, to, to undertake uh, that very much needed capex. Uh, we don't know when, you, when, the, when the hospitality, uh, when the hotel will reopen. So this is an important time for you to be able to, to invest. Um, and and, and we, are, we are supporting our clients on a case-by-case -case basis through, um, through this period. Um, and in terms of IT, IT like, like any other business, we would obviously assess um, on, on its current merit and historical merit as well. Because as I like to say, um, you know, there will be a post-COVID time. So for, for clients who have been doing really, really well pre-COVID, um, we can see that they've been significantly impacted um, as a result of, uh, of their revenues dropping off a cliff during COVID. There is, there is no reason to assume that, um, that historic, their historical performance will not uh, continue post-COVID. So, you know, we will be working with our with our with our clients to assess any business needs that they that they may have. Um, if it is that they're struggling right now, we'll provide. Um, you know, we work with them through this period. But but you know, we we have businesses to run, and so even for IT clients um, and for 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 clients in whichever industry, we want to be able to work with you after uh, this, this um, pandemic has, has kind of come to an end. So we will work with those clients as well. Okay. So to even divulge more into that, that question, um, so for example, myself, uh, being a, a service industry digital, 123 Digital Limited, and also a customer of um, FCIBC, who has helped me out um, throughout my entrepreneurial journey, right? Unfortunately for me, I'm unable to more or less secure a business loan because um, I don't have anything tangible. I have no assets because whatever we do, our websites, um, mobile apps, uh, we do graphics, et cetera, marketing campaigns, et cetera, right? So therefore we don't have any collateral um, during the, the initial application stage, right? Now, a lot of opportunities have, ar ar have arisen during this pandemic. So for example, a lot of digital products, right? If I come to the bank today, right? Um, is the bank or with the banks, not only FCIBC, but the members of the banking, um, the banking association, the members of the banking association, would they be able to assist me in, in providing me a loan for let's say an app which could benefit everybody in the long term? Or would I still have to go through those same um, processes pre-COVID? And, 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 and even to, to let you know, let's say like I, I have a good banking history, right? Would I still have to undergo those same vigorous processes in order for me to produce a product, a digital product post-COVID? Yeah, so 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 that's a, um, I, I know that's a question that is asked on a regular basis, especially by clients in your space and in the technology space in particular. Um, how can the banks help uh, to provide financing um, opportunities for persons like like yourself who are you know not necessarily collateral rich, um, and and you know I must say that that in situations like those, we do have to, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a balancing act. So on one hand, we want to be able to support um, the, 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 the young entrepreneur uh, 
IT tech savvy type of, of a client um, who has or who may be on the, the cusp of, of uh, developing a, an app that you know, could likely uh, generate millions of dollars. On the other hand, we do have a fiduciary duty to our depositors and, and we do have to look at the risk element towards uh, with a view of what happens in a situation where um, that business fails. And the reality is, is that in, in the technology space, lots of businesses fail, um, unfortunately. Um, and so in, in a scenario of a business failing, how does a bank recoup um, the money that it has lent if it doesn't have a, um, a backstop in terms of uh, something tangible security that you can actually realize upon? Um, and then as you stretch that argument, oh, you, 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 know, you kind of have to look at this from the perspective of what if 50% of our portfolio were in businesses of that nature that were higher risk, um, potential for, for significant upside, but also potential for significant downside. And then, as I said, once we stretch that argument out and we look at the, the potential failure rate of such a business um, and the fact that then that loan would have to go into maybe into non-performing category and the overall impact that they will have on the provisions that the bank has to take. And, and as I said, as you follow the, 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 the argument down, down the line, then what is the impact on the viability of the bank um, if a large portion of that portfolio were, were dedicated to such things. So all that to say that we do have an, 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 an appetite to lend towards um, uh, technology interests. Um, but, you know, in a lot of instances, we will require some form of tangible security. Or if it is that, that it's a relatively small um, um, operation and you, uh, you know, under the right circumstances, we could lend, um, you know, a relatively small overdraft, for example, unsecured. We do, we do do unsecured lending in some instances, um, but we have to work with, with that client, look at, assess their, their historical performance, uh, get a full assessment as to how the business is running, strategic plan, those kinds of things, um, and then be able to make a determination whether we can, we can reasonably lend to that specific entity um, uh, and at what amount and at what pricing do you have to price that risk for? Um, so, so a long, a long end of story to say, um, yes, we, we, we can lend to, to, to the tech industry. It is a lot more challenging for us to lend to the, to the tech industry and to industries like yours, Franken, um, uh, because of the fact that in a lot of instances, there's no, um, collateral support to do so. But, but we are we are we are willing to do so. All right. Thank you very much for that, um, Victor. Um, we'll go to our next question. This section is very short because I think we've touched on so many aspects of this topic, right? That um, I don't want it to be. I don't want to be. I don't want it to be repetitive, right? But my next question is on basically. Um, pay cuts, you know, human resource, right? Many private sector businesses have issued pay cuts to their team members in order to keep them afloat. Now, we already heard from Garetti, like her team members, um, they understood, you know, um, straight away. And basically they are they're for the company, you know? Um, Damon, um, you did also mention that some people um, some of your team members did get a pay cut. Others still have the salary, the full salary. Am I correct? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, so with that, you know, like what has the like the proactive steps have you taken? You know, to ensure that you know those individuals are are are, are paid on a regular basis. And when I mean a regular basis, whatever the contractual agreement is, whether it be fortnightly, um, monthly, 
right? And I know due to the pandemic, um, you've seen a reduction in revenue, you know? What steps have you then put in place in order to, I would say, juggle, you know, and, and, and move things around in order to, um, to manage your human resource? Well, Rankin, um, unfortunately, I had to make like a very tough decision um, looking at my sales, my revenue. And I, I had to make that decision to lay off staff. It wasn't easy. But the staff understood. And like I said, they, see, they, they saw the numbers and they saw that if I did not do what I did, it was just not sustainable. For me, it's about um, having the business survive and um, looking at long term continuity and sustainability. Um, uh, what, I, what I plan to do, the proactive measures basically is like focusing on lean management, right size in my company, um, restructuring, um, coming up with online and other solutions to increase sales, um, to operate more efficiently. Um, as, as, as it is slower right now, I find it's easier to step back, look at my whole business model, my business processes, and see where I could implement change that is critical. Um, doing more with less is going to be the new mode of operation for my company. Um, hopefully, um, we'll have changes probably in the next few months, but because of the uncertainty, we opening our borders. Um, I don't know what's, what's going to come if the borders being reopened, um, but I will try my best to safeguard my company in whatever way I can because at the end of the day, people depend on, on me to make the right decisions for the company so that they could continue being employed. And I will continue to do it right. Um, it, it's, it's not going to be an easy road ahead. I've already explained that to my staff. Um, and I've been monitoring weekly as to how I continue to keep my business afloat. A lot has changed. A lot has changed. I will be very transparent with you all. Um, sales have declined. Where I used to go, um, my van used to go on the road five days a week. Now, on the West Coast, we do three days a week, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, because people out there just don't have money to buy stuff. A lot of people have been laid off. A lot of people are going through really challenging times. And I don't think a lot of solutions appreciate what's actually happening right now around the island. Um, Sufre is hit very hard. Sufre has a heavy reliance on tourism. Um, the people who work at the Sulphur Springs, people who work at um, the Diamond Falls, or the restaurants in Sufre, the boating sector that takes people to watch it. I mean, it, it's just a disaster. Um, fortunately, I have a product that people want it. It's, uh, um, they need their, their protein. And I, I, what, what I do right now, I'm also looking at um, cheaper, I, cheaper um, products. So no more pork loin, no more pork ribs. It's more, all right, let's get the chicken box, um, which we will be receiving next week. Um, looking at chicken pie quarters, the cheaper, um, um, the cheaper mm -hmm. chicken products and products that people could, could afford. Because right now, it is tough. It is tough for every person in St. Lucia. Um, and it's, going to, it's not going to be an easy road to recovery. And I want people to know that. Eh? Um, it's real. I'm feeling the pinch. A lot of other people are feeling the pinch. Whether they want to talk about it or not, it's a reality. And it has caused people to go into depression, excess drinking. But that's, the, I mean, like I said, I will continue to do what I have to do. I will monitor my company on a weekly basis. I've asked for reports weekly from my account staff so that I know how to make decisions, yes. critical decisions in my mind. Okay? That's right. Um, Warren, what, has, how what have been the um, proactive steps taken in your organization to preserve your human resource given the impact with cash flow? Because again, early, earlier you did state that um, insurance is the last thing people pay. You know, people don't really, they, take, they don't really take it seriously until like the last moment, you know? 
Um, and Adele, you too, that question is for you as well. You know, um, how do you manage your human resource versus cash flow? Uh, just like Damon, uh, we monitor our cash flow on a weekly basis. I get reports from the accountant if necessary. But our our team has been, I must say, so understanding, so supportive during this time because this pandemic has put us uh, put a lot into perspective for all of us. And while it it poses us um, a bit of a stressful um, situation on our operations, our people remain the backbone of our company. So we would have proactively implemented effective cost cutting measures in various other areas that didn't necessitate an immediate reduction in our staff levels, which we fortunately um, can say for now, we continue communication with our team. So they, they know the reality of it. Um, also trying to keep them motivated because we've had to work on a shift system, rotation system, et cetera, still trying to be productive, still trying to meet our obligations to our policyholders during this time. And as someone who has been with Najiko and Lucia from, from inception, I can definitely say that our team is, is a center of our business and we will continue to, to ensure we do the best we can to maintain that. Um, and we've been doing that so far in the short term, uh, very successfully. Yeah. Warren? Um, <clears throat> fortunately for me, I haven't had to um, lay off any of my colleagues. Um, the, <laughs> only, the only change that has happened really is we're on a sort of rotation system at times, um, and we now have reduced working hours. Um, but for me, a lot of this thing comes down to planning. And from as early or as early as December, you know, we, we were already making certain steps at managing our cash flows. I mean, none of us foresaw COVID-19, but I'm grateful that the strategies that we implemented actually are now kicking in and are saving us during this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the, 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 the thing for me is, well, for me it was an easy decision in the sense that, you know, we have at least 15,000 people um, unemployed or on a reduced salary, according to um, the pronouncements that we've been hearing this, this last few weeks. And for, for for me to have asked um, a, a staff, a colleague, sorry, to accept a reduced income in a household that already suffered, you know, a loss of um, some earning power was a bit unreasonable for me. So I would, the last thing that I wanted or that I would do is to lay off staff or even reduce them. Um, and I'm grateful and I'm thankful that I'm in a position where I'm able to keep my staff employed through this crisis. Um, and with everything hopefully coming back on stream in the next few weeks, um, I do expect um, that even the, the, the pressures that we had on our cash flow in the short term will be addressed and will be resolved. Uh, Dell has been speaking also about the impending hurricane season. Uh, we normally see an increase in premiums being paid um, from January, sorry, from June 1 um, downwards. So my expectation is that we will be able to buffer our cash flows um, over the next few, few months. And I wouldn't have to make the very uncomfortable and hard decision of you know, asking a colleague or a household to suffer more financially. So again, we haven't really been impacted um, in terms of layoffs. All right, thank you. Goretti, I saved the best for last. <laughs> as an entrepreneur and also as a human resource management advisor, consultant, expert, right? Can you bless us with your knowledge? 
<laughs> well, I think from listening to the other panelists, you guys are definitely um, doing the right things. I heard communication being echoed, and that's something that I always um, highlight to managers. It's important that during this pandemic, we keep the communication lines open with our team. And it's about being transparent and being honest with how it has impacted the business. So they have a full appreciation for the challenges that you are facing. Um, and you'll be surprised that they may be more understanding than you expect having the full story. So I definitely advocate for that. Um, in terms of other things to do to manage your HR during a time like this, well, for, for us, we continue to pay medical insurance as an example, you know, even if there were cuts um, and layoffs, just to ensure that persons have that coverage and, and not to leave them completely blind out there, you know. Um, understanding that this in itself creates a whole different set of dynamics um, when we talk about health. So somebody mentioned that depression, we're talking depression, anxiety, and other stress-related conditions. So one of the things we did from very early was to introduce an employer assistance program that our clients can utilize to assist their employees. And that's really providing counseling support for persons who have that challenge dealing with, with a pandemic such as this. So um, I think you guys are definitely going in the right direction in terms of what you've done, making your, moving your organizations to a leaner model, reducing your cost and to, you know, make sure that you remove all the non essential expenses as much as possible. So you're in a position to retain um, staff for as long a period as possible. All right, thank you. Victor, I haven't forgotten you now. Okay. Right, Victor, we have a lot of questions for you. Right, so um, I give you a break on that last question. <laughs> <laughs> because um, the last question, as you know, I, I was gonna ask basically is things that we um, covered already. So I'm not gonna do so. However, this is the end of the initial panel discussion. So I'm going to open it, read the rest of our questions, as many as I can, with um, the limited time that we have, right? Um, but the first question is for Victor, right? Question for Mr. Boyce, can you explain to what extent the monitoriums offered by the banks affect their profitability and their ability to provide cost-effective services to their clients? To what extent the moratoriums impact on profitability? Yeah, to, to what extent the moratoriums offered by the banks affect their profitability and their ability to provide cost-effective services to their clients? Oh, I mean the bank's profitability? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's, okay, from the, from the bank's perspective. Um, yes, yeah, so, so, um, so you, you have to look at this moratoria from this perspective that, you know, during the actual moratoria period, the banks are, are not um, taking in any interest income on those loans for which they're provided interest moratoria. What happens is that that, that interest is accrued on, on the balance sheet of the banks. At the end of the, the moratoria period, then uh, from an accounting perspective, um, once, once um, loans recommence, then interest will start to come back onto the P&L. So, so um, you would see an impact on, uh, from a, a reduction in revenues perspective um, for the banks. Um, that's, a, that's a reality of, of um, the fact that interest income is significantly the largest uh, revenue item that we have, um, then as followed by, by fee income. Um, and so it, it will impact on, on, on the bank's um, profitability. Um, you also have to look at uh, from the perspective of um, from an, uh, you know accounting type rules IFRS nine for example um, you know to the extent that let's say um, IFRS nine initially how banks used to or how companies used to used to account for provisions used to be at a time at the point when you started to see the loan start to deteriorate. 
IFRS 9 has changed that. That says that banks have to start um, providing for a loan from the minute it is booked. Um, and some, you know, um, some formulary uh, throughout the entire life of the loan. So if, for example, you know, post um, moratoria, you start to see those clients that, um, you know, starting to have challenges once the moratoria period ends and, um, and that loan then, um, let's say we've given six months moratoria, there may be a possibility, I'm, 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 not, I'm not sure and I'm not going to presuppose what all the banks are going to do. There may be a possibility that, that we might have to extend um, some of those moratoria. Um, the, the time will come when we will make that determination. Um, but once that moratoria period is done and then some of our clients are having challenges paying, then, then the impact will be on um, some of those loans potentially going into non-performance status. And once then you have to provide um, provisions on your P&L, on, on your profit and loss income statement for those loans for which the clients can no longer pay, then that as well will impact on, on the bank's profitability. Um, the, banks, the banks in St. Lucia are, um, you know, are strong and, and therefore, um, you know, uh, we, we don't, we, we aren't seeing any impact on, on um, us providing any services for our clients right now. Um, but that might change uh, if, if, if this thing prolongs and persists into a year. Um, we, we, we just, we don't know what that will look like in terms of, um, you know, what kind of a hit the banks will uh, have to incur from a provision perspective and a reduction in revenue perspective um, if this thing persists um, into 12 months, 18 months, two years. Um, and so at this moment, um, you know, we are, uh, we are continuing to provide all the services that, are, that, that we have committed to, pro to providing and we will continue to do so. Uh, as I said, if this thing goes into two years, um, you know, we, we will definitely have to, 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 to look at how we, how we do business at that time. Um, so that's, that's, that's pretty much what I'll say on that. All right, thank you very much. Um, Goretti, during this period, some employers have asked employees to take vacation due to them. Is this legal? <laughs> the hot question. <laughs> a few hot questions right now, you know. <laughs> All right. Um, as it relates to vacation, the the advice that has been offered by the Department of Labor is to not use that option, um, because vacation is meant to be a time of relaxation and fun and excitement, which cannot possibly happen happen at this time. Um, and on that basis, employers are being asked to refrain from sending persons on vacation during um, this pandemic. At least now, I think when things um, improve and there's some semblance of normalcy, we can proceed as usual. But in the initial stages, that was the advice received. Okay, great. Right. To those in insurance, across the globe, car insurance premiums have been lowest in years due to cars not being on the road and present situation. So, and present situation, some such as all states even issuing refunds until June. State Farm with reductions as much as 11%. Can St. Lucia look forward to such reductions? I don't believe so because actually if you look at the premiums that are being paid by those, those um, states, it's a lot higher than, than us in the Caribbean. Um, so I don't think it's something that we will be looking at doing. We actually are charging very low for our motor insurance here in the Caribbean. Okay, Warren, you could shed some lights on that, no? I highly doubt you could get okay. a, a. You just agree with the deal. I highly doubt you could get a 500 EC dollar policy. This is your annual premium. 
and you know um, in the US no um just a few things from me uh, <clears throat> one again i understand that persons are now seeking every means of um trying to save a buck um but for me it's simple if you're not using your vehicle then just cancel the import the policy and pack your card home and ask for a refund but um to ask the insurer to continue providing you with cover on a reduced premium i mean the risks are still out there um it's a bit unfair um and I just want to put things in perspective somewhat. And Adele alluded to it just now, talking about you know, the, the, the premiums that people pay in the US or the more developed countries versus the premiums we pay here. Um, just you know, for our own understanding and appreciation, the 100th ranked insurance company in the US writes over 700 million US of premium. St. Lucia's gross return premium as an, as an island just for property and casualty is 50 million US. So just think of that a little bit. You know, we don't have the size or the critical mass to be able to give this sort of um, relief that, you know, we're seeing all over the world. I mean, our insurers are trying as best as they possibly can um, to do that. But I agree with Adele, you know, there is so much that we, we just cannot do at this time. Okay, great. Another question. At the beginning of the pandemic, economists projected a V-shaped economic, economic cycle. However, as the effects of the pandemic continues, these project, projections have been amended to an L-shaped econ, economic cycle. So noting how vulnerable our economy is to the economic shocks, how can the business environment remain afloat in the medium to long term? Anybody choose to answer that? I think it's gonna require us to take a, a hard look at our organizations and identify opportunities where um, we're possibly doing things that don't add value. So again, Damon mentioned it's about being leaner. It's about reviewing your processes to ensure that everything you're doing on a daily basis is actually adding value um, and that you're taking away all of your non-essential expenses as much as possible. Also, identify opportunities, new opportunities, because even within this pandemic, there are new opportunities that it presents. So what other new service offerings that you can introduce into the market um, that you know people will utilize and welcome. It's, it, it, to me, it just requires a change in mindset because we can't really avoid um, the impact of what's happening, but we can we can influence to a great extent how we respond to it. Okay. Question for Mr. Victor. Many organizations have had to reduce staff working hours, staff salaries, or staff numbers, and in many cases, lay off staff. Is there a possibility that banks may also go that route? So, um, so essentially, uh, so the banks, as, as I said before, the banks have been working, um, we've been open, for, for pretty much the entire um, COVID period, except for two weeks. Um, we've been working on reduced opening hours um, from eight to 12 uh, up to now. Um, and as far as I'm aware, all the banks have maintained um, their staff. Um, I can certainly say that on the part of First Caribbean, we've maintained all of our staff during during this period, um, you know, bank staff often don't get, um, you know, bankers in general don't don't often get a lot of credit. We we do know that persons, um, you know, they appreciate the uh, the services that we offer. Um, but I just I I wanted to to say that um, that. You know, our, our, our staff have been phenomenal during this, during this period, um, particularly, um, you know, our frontline workers who 
who face clients uh, on a on a daily basis. Um, you know, have come in, they've come to work pretty much every day, um, and and really just showed up and provided uh, exceptional service um, uh, to, to to our clients. Um, so we have not had any need to at this time for us to um, amend our salaries or to send home any of our staff. Um, as I said, I can certainly make that, make that um, attestation on behalf of First Caribbean. Um, I, I can't say that, that, I cannot say that there may not be changes, like I said before, if this thing persists into, into a year, year and a half, two years, um, some of our banks will have to take some, some tough decisions um, or may have to take some tough decisions, I should say. Uh, but at this time, I'm not, I'm not aware of any decision on, part, on the part of any of the banks to, to, to sign home staff at this time. Okay. All right, to the insurance reps, when it comes to the payment of claims, one of the usual requirements is a police report. Obtaining a report has always been difficult and is even more difficult in this current climate. Is there any compromise by the insurance company seeing that the damaged property un undergoes further deterioration while the claim is pending? We've had instances where we've um, waived the, the police report, but again, it, if, it add, if it doesn't add value to us making a decision on the claim, um, that's the only the area in which we would be able to make that determination. But if there's a contention as to who is liable and who's not, we use it as, as a document to rely on the, what the police officers have, have said, um, just as an example. Okay. But we have had instances where we've waived that because of the delay in receiving that document. Okay, thank you. Um, Damon, this one is definitely you. <laughs> right. Um, if people can't purchase, you can't sell. Have you tried to access the local producers? This can be a pivot. So I think that was addressed when, when you spoke about... Um, you're not bringing the high price items anymore, you more or less bring in bags and stuff like that. Yeah, so the step is ranking the local identification with the processors and producers from early March. And um, what it is because the local cost of production for chicken in St. Lucia is very high, I think it would do. People will not be able to afford um, the, the chicken. So the way the local chicken works in our industry is that we subsidize the local, the local um, producers by buying from them when we import, selling the chicken at selling the local chicken at a lower price and pass that loss on to the imported chicken whereby um, covering farmer loss. So I would love I would love to see St. Lucia get to a place whereby a scale to reduce the price of local chicken, but currently, and, and pork, but currently, it, because we don't have the numbers, and because of the, I, I would say, the lack of governmental assistance for the farmers, it's difficult to lower the cost of production, and um, it, 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 like I said, I want to work with the local processors, I buy from them all the time, but it's cost prohibitive cost prohibitive for the end consumer. Okay, thank you. Um, Gareti, back to you. Can employers issue pay cuts without informing employees? Okay, let's put it this way. The only legal way to reduce someone's pay is by consultation and agreement from the employee. So that requires the employer to have that conversation with the employee presenting the facts to justify why it is necessary to reduce that pay and to get the employee's agreement. And once the employee agrees, it must be put in writing um, and signed by both parties. Okay, thank you very much. 
let me go through some more questions. Right, does doing more with less have implications on employee burnout and overall productivity? What do we mean by this? A lot can be said to maintain the company brand as it pertains to the customer's needs. However, what can be said about sustaining the employer brand during this crisis? I think that has to do with me, Rankin, because I said um, we have to do more with less. Yes. Um, because staff was laid off, right? It means that you have more cross-functional jobs. For example, mm. accounts, accounts department was divided into accounts payable and accounts receivable. But because business has taken a downturn, yeah. you could now and, and the activity is not so much. You could now have the accounting person, um, one person doing accounts receivables and accounts payables. Um, for, for our drivers, you could now have a dragger also playing the role as a porter. So, I mean, doing more with less means that you do more of a different functional job, but you have less people around to help and assist in, in, in the job function. I hope that explains what I, what I try to understand. What, what I, try to I also want to add on, on that, even with my organization, is what I try to do is that, yes, we do have um, reduced hours. However, I try not to go over our newly contracted um, hourly rates. So if, it, let's say, someone is contracted four hours a day at X amount, I would not push it to like five or six because I do understand that like right now, um, I don't want this, the staff morale to drop. You understand? I still want people to be comfortable. I don't want um, my team to be used. However, at the same time, we still have commitments to our own clients. So this is, for me, I think I'm taking a lot of that burden, whereas I absorb all the stress and what I do is basically distribute it evenly, distribute the workload, not the stress, <laughs> distribute the workload <laughs> evenly um, uh, amongst my team. So I think that's my two cents on that, all right? So we have three more minutes left. Right, so just let me read a few more. Um, Adele, is there currently a hold on issuing policies for new medical clients for, sorry, for, uh, let me read again. Adele, is there currently a hold on issuing policies for new medical clients who have lost their jobs? What are the protocols in place for these employees who are under a group policy have been terminated and now want an individual medical policy. I hope I read that properly. Trying to get the parts of the question. Okay, okay. Let me read it again. Adele, well, there, you, you want me to read it again? Right. Um, I, th I think I get the gist of it. Uh, right. For group policies, we help. A lot of our groups are um, placed through brokers. So you find that we would have that ongoing discussion with the broker and maybe um, beforehand they would have already received uh, a two months grace from us, for instance, to sort out um, how they wish to pay their, their policies, whether they continue as an, as an improve with, as the, whether the employer continues to pay or negotiate something different for the groups. With individuals who, who want to take out a new policy right now, yes, we had C's during the, um, this time um, to be revisited by our group administrators as to when we can effect new policies for individuals. Okay, great. Um, Gareti? Yes. People have been laid off indefinitely in some cases with no indication when will they open or when the open when the offices will be reopened. Can one seek alternative employment in the interim? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I think it depends on a few things. 
you it, it would depend on the contract so what does your contract say about seeking alternative employment because some contracts are very clear on that um some contracts may have a non-compete so while you may seek alternative employment it would be um, you would have to be careful not to do that with somebody or an organization that competes directly or indirectly with your employer um your code of ethics may also make reference to that. So you'd have to be familiar with what the conditions of employment are. And so my advice would be to have a conversation with your employer to, to discuss that option and to, to just get the green light as to whether or not you can safely do so without you know, putting yourself at, at risk of some issue later down the line. Okay, cool. Understanding that at this time, business owners slash managers must maintain a financial balance between the need to keep consumers informed and reshuffling of budgets. How important do you see marketing and advertising now to maintain branding and visibility? So, Damon, I could go with you if you want to answer that. Very critical right now that um, you 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 keep your your brand visible. Um, I have been I've been using other social media to push out um, uh, my company's presence and uh, the options that we have available for them. Um, marketing and marketing. And advertising is going to be critical going forward, as um, a lot, a lot, a lot will be changing, and in, in the future, in the in the for, for coming months, and then you also have people who did not know we existed, and now they, they are knowing that okay, there's a company who that that exists who is an essential service in Saint Lucia. So yes, um, marketing and Advertising will have to um, be part of my budgeting, which is a real part of it. It has to be increased. Okay. Okay. Warren, you want to shed some light on this? Um, <clears throat> unfortunately for me, well, well, most brokers, we don't really do too much marketing and, and advertising um, by virtue of the business that we conduct. Um, we go to people and we speak to them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And a lot of us, um, we try to manage the inflow of customers. Um, so we generally don't put out too much publication on, on our business. Um, so it's more personal. I do, however, understand the, the value of, of marketing. Um, I do understand that you, know, you need to be able to promote your product. Um, for me, what we normally do is probably align ourselves with some promotion of a customer um, rather than just putting something out there that advertises a sterling insurance brokers, etc., etc., etc. I do again understand the, the need to try to be top of mind, um, but those things are more reserved for the insurance companies. Or when I say reserved, there's something that is practiced more by the insurance companies rather than us operating within the broking space. So Adele um, might be you know, in a position to speak more on, on what they do and how valuable they see marketing and promotion for the type of business she's in. Well, I did touch on the fact that we would have made adjustments to our, um, our vision for this year. Um, I didn't mention why though, it's because next year we celebrate 10 years. So this year we really wanted to focus on, well, 10 years in St. Lucia. Uh, so we really wanted to focus on uh, reassessing our processes and procedures and ensuring that we, our policies are uh, well suited for our customers' needs, you know, that sort of thing. And we did not plan to do too much heavy marketing this year. And that actually allowed us flexibility to make some of the decisions we needed to make to avoid to the HR, um, the difficult decisions where HR is concerned. Uh, marketing for me is always about staying relevant and remaining in the forefront of your customers' minds. So I will 
plug in here that we, we aim to be fast, fair, and always there. And we continue to do that um, even through these economic, uh, through this economic crisis. And it, as you can see, remains a part of <laughs> me and, and how I operate. <laughs> so I don't think I need to say too much on that. I agree. Look, um, Goretti, you want to say something? Um, well, no, not related to that. I, I just wanted the opportunity to, to say um, one thing before we close, because I realize time is, is yeah. almost there. Um, I just wanted to advise the employers who are listening to take advice from the persons who are knowledgeable in terms of how you deal with the human resource component. It's a very big element. If, if, um, if I can say probably the most important component right now, because you need the employees for, for your, your organization to remain sustainable. Um, so seek the advice, get support from organizations like the Employers Federation, the Labor Department, as it relates to clarity about the Labor Act and what you can and cannot do, because you want to ensure that you remain compliant. The, the Labor Act, of, of course, there are some issues with it. Um, we have some concerns with it, but it is what we have, and we still have to ensure compliance with that. So that would be my, my appeal. I, I just wanted to highlight that before we close, because in a lot of cases, persons may be quick to respond, not understanding that the actions they take are um, not in compliance with the Labor Act and expose them to litigation and issues with staff later down the line. Thank you for your contribution. Um, well, this has come to the end of our third, is it our third? Our second webinar, our second webinar. Um, I would like to thank all our panelists for taking time out today, for sharing the knowledge and experience. And thank you also to the attendees for registering and joining this webinar. And I hope this has been an informative and inspiring session. Be safe, everyone, and see you at the next Evolve. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye. Thank you. All right.